and welcome to Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast with your host, Buddy Sotelo Esquire, and Evan Ginsberg, plus special guest host, Mike Leno. Would you like to introduce our guest tonight? Uh, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with AJ Pan, who is a distinguished heel manager throughout the East Coast, and we've worked on many shows together, and... He brings back, you know, Lou Albano and Fred Blassie and all the old school guys, a great talker, AJ Pan. And I'll let Mike introduce Scott Roma. Mike. Well, Scott is a longtime photographer. He's Evan's guest. I didn't bring any guests on tonight, so Evan gets the prize. Scott's book, When It Was, My Life on Both Sides of the Camera, is out and available now. He's going to be talking about that, his career in wrestling and everything else. He's done rock concerts and Guy, presidents, I mean, pretty much everybody, Muhammad Ali, everybody he's photographed on, on in the, so he's uh, one of our fellow photographers in our, in our gene pool. So Eva, I will throw back to you. All right. So Scott, I read your book and what popped into my head was these are Damon Runyon like characters that you've, that you've rolled with over the years, whether it's boxing, wrestling, entertainment, even politics, some of those guys are a little shady. So tell us about the book. Well, it's a um, book, obviously, it's about me. I've had these wonderful experiences in my life, and um, my 30 seconds of fame keep on happening because I keep on getting these gigs with some very, very important people. Um, I may be shooting an event with the president. I may be walking with the um, uh, Israeli prime minister. You never know. Plus, I was a wrestling photographer uh, and, and still am since the 70s. And um, um, I share my, my life with the readers. My and exceptional, I, I'm, fantastic I'm, I'm reading life. This. I'm reading this. You're at a boxing card and the promoter comes up to you and goes, how would you like to fight tonight? And next thing you're in the ring. I mean, there's some wild stuff in this book. Tell us about that story. Well, I've been hooked up in the boxing business since the late 70s, just like I was wrestling. And um, uh, on a local basis, there was a promoter by the name of Fred Burns. And um, I was fascinated with boxing, and he would let me into the shows and photograph the events. And um, all of a sudden, I became family to Fred. And uh, uh, Fred was a uh, also booked fighters overseas, and I would go overseas with the fi with the fighters and babysit them. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. You asked me how I got stuck in the ring. Um, I was at a boxing show and um, working it as a photographer, and there was a kid that sold a lot of tickets. The whole the, the whole town was there for him, and um, um, his opponent didn't show up. And no one else would fight him, so I was asked to fight him. They told me he this was his first fight, but he was yeah. actually an amateur champion. Wow! And, um, wow! Um, I went into the ring and um, and and lasted probably a minute. And uh, referee saw that I was way and way overmatched, and thank goodness he stopped the fight. But what does it say for your friends throwing you in the ring? with a guy who's had 200 amateur fights or whatnot? Well, um, he was hooked up. His manager was a man by the name of George Randazzo. And you read about George Randazzo as being one of my surrogate fathers in my book. George Randazzo is the Italian gentleman that uh, had all kinds of connections. And uh, because he saw that I had guts, he made me his personal photographer, and he's the one, whenever you see pictures in my book with Siegfried and Roy at dinner, or the president, or um, um, the pr uh, chief justice of the United States, it was George that got me to the gigs to photograph these events and meet these wonderful people. That's awesome. That's what, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I mean... There's some really colorful stories in there, some colorful characters. And you did heel managing, just like Buddy Sotelo did for APW, and Mike Leno did with Gordon Scazzeri's promotion, and AJ Pan has done, and I've even done a bit, bit of that. So why don't we talk about that? 
Scott, tell us about your experiences as a heel wrestling manager. Well, um, I uh, married Dick the Bruiser's daughter. And a day or two after my wedding, he said, Scott, I need a manager. I just fired my other manager. And um, I became character Saul Creechman, a, a combination of Eddie the Brain Creechman and gentleman Sal Weingroff. And I was from Miami Beach, Florida. And because I know wrestling and I used to emulate these people, it became a natural fit. And I was the hated manager in the World Wrestling Association owned by Dick the Bruiser. Um, and um, we held, uh, I had a tag team called the World Warriors, not the, not the Road Warriors, but the World Warriors. And um, and we became uh, WWA Tag Team Champions. Uh, I also managed Harley Race on a show. Wow. That was my very first debut as a manager. Now, take it, they never trained me or anything. I just went out there. And the first couple matches, they beat the shit out of me. Yes. And um, um, I took it, and I didn't quit. And... Um, um, I got to manage these wonderful people. And then later on in my career, um, after I had been out for a good 10 years, I was manager of Rip Rogers. Um, and uh, I used to go on the road with Rip Rogers everywhere. That's awesome. And AJ, and tell us about some of the craziest things that have happened to you as a heel manager. Uh, <laughs> the war I'd say the craziest in my mind would be uh, when uh, I became one half of the ECWA Tag Team Champions, when I had no idea that was going to happen the day of the show. <laughs> one of the guys in the match uh, no-showed. Uh, he had car problems. So get to the building, and the promoter's like, hey, uh, how's everything going? Oh, going great tonight. Oh, so how do you feel about competing tonight for the Tag Team Championships? Like, wait, what are you talking about? I'm, yeah. I'm a manager. No, nope, you know, don't worry about it. It's going to be good, but... Yeah, you're gonna be competing tonight. So, and tonight, uh, end up winning, winning the getting the pinfall and becoming a uh, tag team champion. Wow. As a manager, as as going and being a manager, or I'm, yeah, I'm, I was just a manager. Yeah, and, and you became a that, and that was your debut. No, no, that just like, happened during uh, just one of the shows. It was like not okay. planned at all. Never had the plan for that to happen. That's you were over, baby. There's no <laughs> other feeling. <laughs> There, there's Did no you have other any uh, any kind of training on on how to do offense because it's one thing as a manager. I mean, most of the time at APW, I was being taught how to take punishment, and you know, the only kind of you know moves I ever was taught to do were you know the silly little stomps and the slaps and the you know the the heat getting stuff, but nothing because obviously they don't want to see a manager get over on bigger talent. So I was never course, taught how yeah, to do yeah, anything. Yeah. Did you actually? Yeah, how did no, you? Yeah, no, basically, yeah, basically the match was booked like I, you know, I come out in the beginning and just you know make it look like I'm gonna, I'm oh yeah, I'm a tough guy. Fine, I'll do this. Then I run off like a chicken shit. The other guy works most of the match. He gets him down. Quick tag in. You know, put in a boot here and the other run back to the corner. And uh, you know, the the final segment was you know a blind tag in. I get tossed in the ring. I get <laughs> my ass kicked for about two, three minutes. Uh, spills to the outside. Uh, one of the other guys I manage, he runs in with his belt, knocks the guy out, throws me on top, and that's how I be that's how I get the pinfall. So yeah, that means you I, had I, to defend. You had to defend your championship too, so that meant getting your ass whipped more. Uh, well, well, no, see, no, then we were able to do a free bird rule. So yeah. <laughs> So it, the next show we established the the PCA rule. That was that's the name of my group. So yeah, I was allowed to <laughs> not defend it again. <laughs> AJ, I can immediately tell great talker. Um, tell us about your upbringing, because most of us obviously really um, respect guys that you know watched wrestling growing up as little kids and all of that. So I'm hoping that's true for you. But tell us. Basically, your your start, you know, watching where you grew up, watching wrestling, who you watched, and and how you got into it to uh, to do everything you're doing now. I uh, born and raised in New York, uh, Lower Manhattan, and one night uh, just happened to be my dad's a big boxing fan, so I was flipping through the channels one night, and it was the Saturday night's main event. It was Hulk Hogan versus Randy Savage, and 
James Buster Douglas was the guest referee. He had just beaten Mike Tyson. So I'm just, we're just flipping the channels. I'm like, oh, wait, that, that's one of the boxes, you know, daddy wanted, daddy knows. He's familiar with. And all of a sudden, I just became enamored. Like, Randy Savage was one of my first favorites. I just loved the glitz and the glamour that he, he brought to wrestling, his character. And I'm like, I remember as a little guy, you know, nine, ten years old, like, I have to find out what this is. I have to watch more of this. This is, you know, enthralling. And then plus my mom and my grandmother are big soap opera fans. So it kind of merged both my, my dad's interest and my mom's interest once I started watching it. And I'm like, this is fantastic to watch. I got to, you know, see more what it's all about. And uh, in the 90s, so I was watching, uh, you know, Superstars Wrestling Challenge and just becoming so involved in it and flipping through channels. And then, oh, wait, what's this on TBS? Another WCW, what is this? Saturday night. So I just started learning more and more and got so involved in it. And I would watch Global Wrestling uh, on ESPN when I got home from school. I found out that was on. I'm like, oh, wait, who are these guys? Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. I like this guy. And it just evolved from there. And I became kind of, as a kid, like, that was my thing. People had comic books, others had baseball. Wrestling became my true love. So I wanted to find out whatever I could. And, of course, you know, all I knew first was WWF. So going to Madison Square Garden and then later on during about maybe once they started going to shows, I met uh many of you know uh, George Yeah. 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 So Friends me and my mind became we all, go to all of us. We all shot with George. Yeah. yeah. AJ, we all yeah. go back to Georgie to the seventies, early seventies. Yeah, she was a fan fantastic person. So she helped get me a little, you know, started taking me to independent shows, uh at uh Dennis Corluzo's NWA. ECW, uh, the ECW A when it was run by Jim Katner, and I just fell in love with the independence. I'm like, wow, this is this is something so different. I love this, and yeah, from there, just wanted to learn everything I could. And you know, as a 15 year old now in high school, going to conventions, then starting to help out doing you know Polaroids, this and that, setting up to help help sell T-shirts, whatever I could learn. That's what I basically did in the beginning. Do you know, is uh, Johnny Rod still running his school at Gleason's Gym? Because uh, that was like the premier place and so many talents came out of there, guys that the Savoldis used, etc. And I probably saw you and maybe even met you at some of Coraluzo shows in uh, Deptford, New Jersey and some of those other uh, places. I was constantly going back there and staying at his I house. Th- I, I, th- I think at least we rode once in, jo- in the Georgie band, the famous Georgie band. I'm yeah. pretty sure we did once to uh, the Coraluzo show. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, that was those were fun times because, like in the hotel, particularly for his Eddie Gilbert annual uh, conventions, he used Eddie, you know, all the time. And then when Eddie died, he would do these annual things for about four years, and he would have yes. Tom Gilbert and Peggy and the whole family come up. Very and, cool. And then the shows would be like, and Scott, these are people you, you and I both know too from Indianapolis. Uh, Oh, God, uh, Brian Trammell, BT Trammell, BT Express and stuff. They would be a million matches. There would always be valets and managers for each guy. The shows would go on seven, eight hours, if uh, AJ remembers. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like, that was the first time a lot of us, well, like, going back as far as 1990, seeing uh, uh, the adoptive grandfather, Chris Candido, Popeye, come down, Chuck Richards, uh, who, you know, job for Vince Sr., and many other things but was a, a legend come down there. So yeah, those are a real trip. It, 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 I'm hoping Johnny Rods has still got his school going because uh, I think Dreamer and Public Enemy and the Dudleys all trained there. Uh, so many talents. Uh, I know he was running pre-pandemic. So now obviously New York, yeah. we, we, have no, we have nothing up and running yet. Hopefully in a, you know, a couple of months we can start again. But yeah, I don't think he's been doing anything, you know, even like privately really, but his name is always talked about, and he was running right before the pandemic, still in training. So hopefully he can get back to that. Last question for both of you guys. How Do you guys have any forthcoming shows? Is anybody going to be doing shows? For Scott, you're still in Indianapolis, or around Indianapolis, aren't you? A suburb. Yes. And AJ in New York. Anybody doing, like, outdoor shows where people are sitting in their cars or anything like that in, in New York or Indianapolis? Well, they've opened it up. So they're at the arenas, Oh, um, armories and arenas or whatever. So uh, um, I've been able to manage on a few shows in recent uh, days. And uh, it's, it's good to know I'm still remembered. And every once in a while, I still get booked on a show. Now, this is going to be a busy week. 
the next few weeks because we've got a, um, a fan fest where I can sell my books here in Indianapolis. I forgot the name of the, of the group that's doing it. Um, then I've got WCW and uh, two or three other organizations. So for the next month, I've got bookings every weekend. And then I may not, not work for another year. You know, you never know. But it, it, it's fun that I'm still remembered. There you go. Uh, uh, New York isn't running yet, but I have two shows out. New Jersey is pretty much running. Uh, they do mostly outdoors. Uh, you, they are doing indoors, but it's still because they have a capacity still. So not many are doing indoors. They're rather doing tapings. But, yeah, uh, they're doing outdoors. Uh, I had my first show in seven months about two weeks, uh, three weeks ago. Uh, I have one this coming Saturday uh, in Jackson, New Jersey for Titan Championship Wrestling. And the week after in uh, Boonton, New Jersey for Upper Limit Wrestling, I am doing color commentary. Who, last question. Who uh, are some of the promoters, at least names that we might know in Jersey and Philly, that area, that legendary area of super wrestling hotbed? Who's there now? I don't know, like, if CCW is planning shows, if they're still around, hopefully post-pandemic. There's a lot of new faces. Um, there's a Titan Championship Wrestling, who I just started with, and they're a newer company. Uh, Billy Fetsky is the uh, main promoter. Uh, they're, they're, from what I've seen so far, they've run a very well locker room. I like what their company's going for. Um, ECWA is still running. Uh, they have a new owner, but John Finnegan and Joe Zanoli are still involved in that. Uh, I think Chad Mines. The John Finnegan? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, he's still around. He's refereeing. He, just, he was just inducted into the uh, ECWA Hall of Fame their last uh, event, I believe. There was a ring announcer for Detroit with the last name Finnegar. Bob Finnegan. Yeah, Finnegan, <laughs> okay. Right on, you got it. Yeah, there's a Dave Brzezinski, Terry Sullivan guy. Mm. And, and, buddy, what was the craziest thing that happened to you as a heel manager for APW or NOAA? Um, uh, other than having to... Uh, Shave uh, Dalip Singh's back, the great Kali. Yes. I mean, actually, you know, hey, when a guy who's seven feet tall gives you a, a an electric razor and goes, "Buddy, shave here," you know, <laughs> what are you gonna do? You you, you can't you can't say no to the guy. So, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I I think the the craziest time that that, that I had was being part of a uh, no holds barred. Um, uh, tag team match where it was uh, 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 absolutely totally unscripted and it was uh, weapons everywhere and I was like I was like I didn't I didn't want to get booked for this but I was like now I'm here what am I gonna do so I one of the uh, guys that we re that was wrestling with us had a um, a two by four that was wrapped in barbed wire real barbed wire and so I just basically grabbed that thing and <laughs> hid in a corner you know, until, you know, three quarters of the match is over. And then I got choke slammed by two guys and I just rolled out of the ring and I said, that is it. I don't want to be a part of it. those street brawls can be like a lot less like scripted than you think they are. And they can be really wild. Those guys, you know, they, they, they want to show how, how tough they are and how much uh, a damage they can take, especially back in that time of the early 2000s when, when extreme wrestling was really popular, you know, and ECW was at its height. You know, the idea was, you know, if weapons came out, you used them, and you used them to draw blood, and a lot of it. So I'm glad my forehead has stayed relatively intact throughout all that time. What about you guys? What about you, AJ? Russ, that uh, you actually promoted, besides performing as a, a heel manager, oh, you yeah. actually promoted shows I shot in Pleasanton at the fairgrounds. Which oh, was yeah, with the California best. Championship Wrestling. That was, yeah, the later day, the stages when when I, I was working in, in uh, doing stuff in Newman in Central California. And that was different because, you know, I was working with the owner and trying to make CCW into a big deal. And we we made a good splash, but you know, over time it's hard to keep things like that up and running. And uh, money is always the biggest issue of all. You know, makes the difference. Lot, that was the first things. place a lot of people saw Tim Thatcher, who's now a huge star in NXT, as well as Reno Scum, huge stars in uh, Impact, which formerly TNA. Oh yeah, I worked at, and we had Brian Cage there. We had, um, uh, and one thing was Brian Cage used the Mortis gimmick, which a lot of people didn't realize that 
that Cage was a good friend of uh, of Canyon. And Chris. Um, yeah, Chris really? Canyon. Chris Canyon actually bequeathed the Mortis suit to Brian Cage. So if you, he ever wants to bring that gimmick back, it will be Brian Cage that does it. So, you know, he was good. He was really actually really good as Mortis. So I wouldn't be surprised if Brian Cage didn't consider bringing that back. So, but I want to know a little bit more about AJ and what, what is some of the big names that AJ has been working with. Uh, I've worked with in my group the PC. I've worked with um, uh, Jesse Goddard, Mr. Spectacular. Uh, Tasha Steeles uh, was a member of my group uh, before she went up to obviously yeah. Impact. She uh, recently she's killing it there in Impact. Uh, recently, um, uh, Brandy Lauren, who just got signed as uh, Skylar Story. Uh, otherwise, you know, I've, I've helped book shows. So I've worked with pretty much the last couple of years. I worked with uh, Drew McIntyre before he went up to WWE. Uh, WWE. Johnny Gargano, Candice LeRae, Tommy Dreamer, uh, Terry Funk was one of my favorites, like the, my, one of my true heroes. So I got to ring it out for him and, you know, just talk to him for a little bit. That was one of, I think, my highlights of my career. But, what, was yeah, like yeah, what, what, what was it like working with him? What was it like working a show with Terry Funk? It was just, I mean, I was so like, I, it was fun. So there was a convention earlier in the day and he was, I, he was about to leave. We were going to our car and I just happened to see him. So I, I, I went up to him and said, excuse me, Mr. Funk. I said, huge fan of yours. I met you in the past before, but I'm working with you tonight at House of Hardcore. And he has the warmest smile. He puts his arm around me and shakes my hand. And he's, oh, pleasure to meet you, kid. You know, we're going to have a good time tonight. You know, looking for going to be a great show. I'm like, yes. And I'm, I, in, 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 my, in my head, I'm marking out big time. I'm like, this is amazing. I'm like, actually talking, to, you know, going to work with a, a legendary icon like Terry Funk. And he's just, you know, being so humble and so gracious. Sometimes it can go either way with people in the industry as we all know absolutely now i actually got to meet um harley race once scott so i wanted to know a little bit about what it was like to manage harley race you know um that was the first time i ever heard a wrestler sound like a ventriloquist he knew how to throw his voice and um telling the opponent what to do but it sounded like it was coming out of another angle Really? Wow. It was, like there was, it was almost like there was a microphone right next to me when he did it. And wh while he's selling it, <laughs> you know how he did his thing and then throw that word in, uh, meaning like throw me out of the ring or whatever he would he would tell the guy. But it was it was quite fascinating. And um, um, I, I was one of the photographers for Kansas City as well and St. Louis Wrestling Club. So there were times that I drove with Harley and he was a wild man on the road. Do you have any stories from when he was a wild man on the road? Well, um, let's see. Story, you know, I mean, n normally just eating at the um, Waffle House and um, um, attending the show, you know, I, 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 I didn't get into politics more or less so um what was the typical harley race order at the waffle house well we were, we're looking at 40 years ago um uh, you know eggs bacon and um the typical stuff that they have there but a lot of it you know scott you guys didn't go to ted drew's the famous st louis uh, milkshake place where you you hold the milkshake upside down and if any of them comes out within a minute they uh, give you your money back and you keep the shake you remember that place uh, i don't but we went to on the landings me and brody went to first national drink and that was on the um river there and um um i have a i had a lot of good times with brody and um, my pictures are in the uh, Brody book. And of course, the uh, uh, marquee picture that was on the um, Beyond the Ring series, the number one, the first year, that was my picture of Brody that I took that they had permission to use. What was Brody like outside the ring as a person? Very smart and very nice, very well-spoken and... Um, um, uh, he would get stirred up and tell me about how Vaganya tried to fuck him on money and all this other stuff. And then he got over by not going into the ring, but uh, fighting on the outside, Greg Brunzel. And uh, he, he would complain about not being able to be with his family and then uh, uh, wrestling for this shit crowd. And um, 
the lack of money that he made wasn't worth leaving his family over on that particular time with him. Did you know his we, Barbara we, before? Uh, you had to know Barbara before he uh, was murdered. Barbara or Brody? Brody's, I mean, Brody's widow, Barbara, and the son, Jeffrey. I, I met Barbara at uh, one of Herb Simmons' shows oh, yeah. in the uh, 80s. And um, um, she was always a nice lady. And um, Brody spoke very highly of me. And I was in with him. I would take him downtown Indianapolis and shoot all kinds of pictures on the monument. And we'd go discoing and... Um, he even we even picked up my ex my wife at the time Dick the Bruiser's daughter and took her with us and that was just a few months or year, maybe a year after Brody beat the shit out of Bro or um, sucker punched Bruiser. There's a, a long story on that. Let's hear. Room. Have you heard it? No. No, it was um, uh, Bru Bru Bruiser stiffed Brody on a payday and um when brody when bruiser was coming upstairs brody um hit and then sucker punched him and put a hole in brody in bruiser's head or busted it open and when bruiser said when i get up i'm gonna kill you and brody left the arena and dutch our version of dutch savage ended up um driving him to the airport and brody was still in his um trunks and boots and stuff. Wow. So that was, it was, was wintertime, too. That was when he was through. He never came back to the WWA again, right? Actually, he did. Really? Bruiser used him again, and Bruiser paid him what paid him the extra whatever he stiffed him on, and when he paid him, he did it like, um, like a gun, but he had the money right here <laughs> or take it, you know, just to plant something into Brody's head, but uh, they were fine after that. Wait a minute. So Frank didn't blame Wilbur Snyder was the one that did the paydays, right? Wasn't he Bruiser, responsible for Bruiser? Bruiser got the heat for it, and Bruiser ended up getting sucker punched because he was with the office. Of course, he and Snyder were with the office, but Bruiser's the one that got sucker punched. But for the most part, um, I understand Bruiser held his own. You know, it was quick. And um, um, Brody and Bruiser, uh, no one had to pull him up. Or no, no, Spike pulled, Bro pulled Brody off. That's right, Spike Huber. Husband number one. So son-in-law, married to his, the, the, yes. the same daughter that you were with or different daughter? That same, same, same daughter. It was Spike Huber was husband number one. I'm husband number two. Um, Dick the Bruiser Jr., the local wrestler in Fort Wayne, is husband number three, and uh, Spike Huber's husband number four and husband number one. Wait, she remarried. Uh, she remarried Spike, and they're still together. Yes, yes, they are. And I spoke to her just recently when she wanted to sell Dick the Bruiser's um, plaque that he got in WCW when, when he was um, honored after death and she received the award at Slamboree. You know which one I'm talking about, don't you? The Tampa one, uh huh? Is that where it was? Yeah. So she wanted to sell that plaque and, and would not tell me nor Herb Simmons what she wanted for it, but saying that it's going to be very expensive. And that's really the last I heard of her. Neither one of us felt like getting hustled. Last question on at least Spike. Is he uh, one of those that doesn't want to talk about the business? You never hear of him, and he was such a big deal for that short period of time in WWA. Well, um, Herb was convinced Spike to come to one of his events, and they were going to honor him. And my ex-mother-in-law was going to go, and Michelle. And I, of course, was going to go. Nice family reunion. But it was right when COVID did yeah. so they canceled it so um hopefully we can all get together and catch up i just remember he had like similar body type i forget what year he debuted it was like 76 something like that you're very good i think 70 yeah 76 uh the same year steve regal made his debut that was the american steve regal before the yes. youth correct yeah 
Wilbur Snyder's son-in-law. So Spike Huber was Bruiser's son-in-law, and Steve Regal was Wilbur Snyder's son-in-law, and it was Bruiser and Snyder that owned the organization, the World Wrestling Association. Which was odd because when Bruiser got the name, it's kind of like the Sheik working early on when Shire started in San Francisco in 61. You know, he came back and he had the same titles that Shires had had previously, U.S. champion, NWA world tag champions. Bruiser stole the belt. He never dropped it. He didn't want to drop it back to Blassie in L.A. for the WWA Los Angeles, which was a global, you know, that was where Ricky Dozen was world champion. It was a, you know, second really only to the NWA. AWA pretty much paralleled in, in any way. Uh, so he creates WWA and... You know, that first belt was Jewel Strongbow's belt from L.A., so it was kind of bizarre. Did he ever talk about that or any Wilbur Snyder stories? Because Wilbur was a huge legend in California. I don't know if uh, Dick Apples took him with him. Uh, he was sold from Van Nuys, California. Wilbur Snyder, the man of a thousand holds. Um, no, Bruiser never talked about that, you know. Um, of course, there was Barnett before Bruiser, Bud Estes. And um, let's see, but I, I had never heard of any of the uh, stories other than what I've read in the magazines. It's so weird that uh, uh, Jim Barnett Lake had a piece of Detroit, too. I forgot his the partner's name. Now. It wasn't Burt Ruby, but it was the other guy before Sheik bought it from Jim Barnett. So Jim Barnett, Indianapolis, he had his hand in Ohio a bit without half. And, of course, Detroit, Kobo and Olympia Stadium. When, and, and, of course, the huge deal was when Bruiser tried to run against Sheik. Sheik at Kobo, air-conditioned Kobo, Dick and WWA and all that great talent at Olympia Stadium, which is in the dangerous part of town, a little more dangerous building. But loaded with talent for both groups. It was an amazing period of time, like 72 through 75. They were running their shows on the same day, weren't they? I thought... Sometimes, but I thought one was Friday, one was Saturday. Okay. He loaded up. I mean, loaded. I mean, you'd have Moskris and Blassie, Evan. I think I might have told you this. When Koba was really in, uh, you know, he, uh, Sheik was enlisting the help of uh, Munchnik and asking NWA help. Uh, you'd have Moskris and, and Blassie, who people have no idea. And they're wrestling in like second or third from the top, but Dave Brzezinski would know better. Danny Hodge would come in. He'd never worked for Sheik before, uh, you know, before his accident, but his NWA junior champion. Uh, and Buddy Rogers did a couple of shows. I forgot who he worked with. It was Don Kent or somebody like that. They were packed, and then a bruiser's in, you know, just loaded. He would, I guess he'd ask Vern, his partner in Chicago, to send him talent. And, uh, you know, just amazing shows from both guys. And the fans benefited, you know, similar to Montreal. And then Ann Gunkel in Atlanta taking on the whole NWA and Ed Booker, Bill Watts for promoter Paul Jones. Not the wrestler Paul Jones, but the promoter Paul Jones. I, I'd just like to say that Dr. Mike Leno and Scott Roma have forgotten more about wrestling than most people will ever know. I'm sitting, <laughs> I'm sitting here like a fan just listening to you guys, you know? The, the knowledge these guys have, it's amazing. But that was a magic period, Evan. I keep, you know... Because you were going to the garden, the Nassau Coliseum, what, what 74, uh, thereabouts. That's right, that's right. The territories were so much fun. It was a magic period of time. You know, I love the indies now. Now, there's too much effing wrestling. Let me run by what you got. You've got on Saturday, Sunday nights, you got three hours on A&E. Mondays is Raw. Tuesdays, you have to watch Young Rock. You've got NXT. You've got uh, Billy Corgan's NWA. Wednesdays, uh, AEW. Thursdays is almost a 20, or excuse me, a 12 hour block from Impact. They start by showing an old pay per view from like 10, 12 years ago. And it's, a, I wouldn't even show that stuff because it's worlds better than what they're, you know, they have now when it was TNA. But it's, you know, didn't have a pre show for an hour, they had two hours of Impact, and then a post show after that, normally with old matches. Friday, SmackDown. Sunday, or excuse me, Saturday, tons of lucha, pay per view streaming. Are AJ, you guys, AJ watches everything. AJ, what it, what's worth watching? Because I don't watch much of anything. My favorite show, NXT is my favorite show of the week. Mm -hmm. I think it's the best, well written. They actually develop characters. I, yeah, yeah it's, and, you know, plus I've worked with so many of the people, I have a little bit more of attachment to it. But, like, 
it was it, it was bad. I get where people want AEW to succeed, but it's tough for me to watch AEW sometimes. It's you know you see so many things with their they're they're just like slacking a bit on like the, even the timing. Like if you watch Raw, they they, they time their commercial break so perfectly when somebody's outside of the ring. Whereas AEW, there will be a big spot going on. Oh, we're gonna go to commercial now, picture in picture, and it's like they're frantic to get to the commercial. I would be on. pissed off if I was a talent and I didn't get picture in picture. Your match, you know, they just have it real short. That's when you know you're on the low end of the stick if you're not getting picture in picture or you're not getting replays. If they don't show replays during your match, you didn't have any good high spots or anything going on. Yeah, and I don't know. <laughs> oh, I yeah, did a shoot NXT, with... Yeah, uh, I'm I, sorry. I, I, NXT's about uh, the best and they keep storylines pretty much going and again, like AEW, like, You'll see, so like you'll see Miro, and then he won't be seen again for like three weeks. They got too much talent, and you're not seeing them. That's the problem. And they're yes. throwing them on the the YouTube shows. So you have to watch their YouTube shows for their green talent and, and some of their others. But Scott, you were going to say something. I I did a shoot with AEW uh, about a year and a half ago, and um, more or less I wasn't the ringside photographer. Um, what South? What's his first name? Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, they don't let any of us. It's only Lee South. I, Lee South, yeah. Lee South, that's correct. I had to shoot up in the cheap seats and um, point down, so it takes the fun out of doing it. But did you enjoy the shows? Because they're all we all want them to all these groups to succeed. You know, impact. Uh, yeah, I did, and and you know, I I like to feel like I'm involved in one way or another, even if I had to shoot up there in the thing, just to be part of the show. And being introduced to the guys, um, that, that's where I get my my uh, my jack. You know what I'm saying? What, what were some of the matches you saw? The main event, Cody was in the. Of course, I, I can't remember all their names. Um, I'm I'm sorry, I'm blank on the names. AJ, right. I I have, I have a question for you um, because you and I are a little bit closer in 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 age range, you know than. So some of the the older guys here, but how does it how does it uh, how does it make you feel like when you've been working with someone who's a relatively unknown guy and then see him make his way into the pros or her make it into the pros? How what is your feelings like when you see that happen? Oh, it's a great feeling. I you know I get like like we said we want to see everybody succeed and somebody I've worked with and I had a good relationship with and you saw talent and them. Of course, we want them to you know, move forward and go to a NXT or AEW or a SmackDown. So, you know, when I see them and I see them performing well and even, you know, if they get into a big stage or some of them, you know, once in a blue moon, shoot them a text and be like, oh, so your match, congratulations on this. And they're still as humble as they were back when you work with them makes it even better. But happy to see like certain guys like love seeing Johnny Gargano doing so well. He was always a good guy. Uh, McIntyre's fantastic. What a talent. John, All right, Johnny, oh, yeah, he's, I love Johnny. Okay, he's such a great, yeah. And I, I love, people People aren't taken. Some people are, on, well, the internet, the internet sets a whole, Twitter, I hate Twitter. But uh, I think Johnny's doing great in this heel role because it's kind of him, but he's just being a weasley little, like, smartass. It's great. I love it. His I wife, I shot her debut match in California. She was working both Northern and Southern California. She started in Southern California, but she would come up and she would actually, Russ, she would work in APW. She was managing uh, two guys doing a rock star gimmick. And um, she's always been really super nice. But to see what she's doing as well, just amazing. And then them pairing, because a lot of us thought she was going to marry Joey Ryan. But I guess, thankfully, now that he's been cancel cultured out of think <laughs> so. that they were going to get married. And, and fortunately, she went with Johnny Gargano, who's to the moon as a talent. Mike, yes. you and I have very similar backgrounds as far in photography and in the wrestling business as far as working with the Japanese magazines and Bill After's magazines and getting your pictures published in the best ones and putting those guys over. Yeah, and that's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's weird how it's, uh, it still consumes, I'm sure it consumes your life the way it does mine. It's almost, I was on busted open yesterday that serious xm show and then asked to, to come back to finish my thought because uh, anyway on a, a lot of stuff and i was talking about and maybe scott and evan you know this history wise 
it's like these guys and Tommy Dreamer is kind of a, a historian by virtue of him, you know, being around the business forever in so many capacities. But a lot of guys didn't know that Randy Savage's pomp and circumstance. That was gorgeous George's music in like 1952. He was the first guy to have entrance music, Buddy Rogers the second, and then it stopped, and uh, nobody was using it. In fact, Rogers, there's footage that exists, Scott. I don't know if you've ever seen it of Rogers standing there next to Nat King Cole playing and singing Nature Boy on a piano. And I thought I heard it. I've been told by like Tom Burke that Toots Mont told Rogers that music's kind of depressing. Uh, you know, it's just not an upbeat song the way Pomp and Circumstance, which ever, all of us heard when we graduated high school or college was. And then entrance music ceased until 1977 when Bad Bad Leroy Brown, I forget his real name, uh, but he was in, he came into our, my home base, my primary home base, Los Angeles LaBelle, uh, doing that gimmick and playing the Jim Croce song. And it was on a loop because he was really heavy and it took him forever to get to the ring. So you might go through three renditions of that song on a loop. And about the same time, Ray Candy, another African-American legend in Florida, was using the jazzy Superfly song. I, it, you know, no lyrics, nobody's singing on it. And I never knew why Snuka never used that. And then, of course, two years after that, and then the Freebirds use it. And then, boom, entrance music is used by everybody. Now nobody even thinks about it. It's a second thought. But when, like, the Freebirds did it, that song, Free Birds by uh, oh, Leonard Skinner. Leonard Skinner. It's a long song. And there were times when they they played the entire song with all the jerking around and getting to the ring and doing all the shit inside the ring, the three of them. You know, Waving the Confederate flag everywhere. They they That's a good way to not take bumps and extend your longevity in the business. You know, if the promoter says go up 15 minutes and you got a 10 minute song. And I think they had to kind of sober up a little bit. They needed the 15 minutes. To, to, you know. Well, whether sober or not, Terry Gordy was one of the absolute best talents ever. And he made his debut against Ernie Ladd as Terry Mecca in the IWA, the Eddie Einhorn, uh, which Evans saw uh, in the 1975 thing, where he tried to take on both the NWA and Vince Sr., which was, that was a, such an amazing, boy, AJ, if you were just a little bit older, and you had gotten to see those three outdoor Roosevelt Stadium shows that me, Napolitano, after Frank Amato and the John Rizzi shot. Those were the fucking days. It was amazing. Amazing. And the first show, who sneaks into the locker room just to spy and see what's going on? Sam Munchnik, Sheik, that's Eddie Farhat, the real and uh, Johnny Powers and Anoki, and the original uh, ballet guy from wrestling, Ricky Starr, who later... He and Thez and Johnny Powers started working on these shows because Pedro Martinez was lead uh, booker for Eddie Einhorn. That, that, thems were the days, and Scott knows how magical and fun they were. Well, I got to shoot that kind of excitement in my area, um, Indianapolis and then AWA for Ganya. Um, as a photographer, I'm very, very fortunate to be able to say that I worked with the Von Erichs in Texas uh, Mid-South, I worked at least one major territory um, in, in my life. One of, the, of, of all the major territories, I worked for all of them at least for one match, one show. And that was the Japanese uh, wrestling magazine, Gong. Do you remember Wally Yamaguchi? I stayed at his house. He, would have, he insisted I stay at his house. He was my editor there. Right. He he took me on the Shinkansen. So every time I would go, particularly in 90 and 91, he insisted I stay at his house. So the second time in uh, March of 91, Meltzer convinced me to go right back. I'd just been there for much of January of 1991. And then uh, the very first NWA versus New Japan at the Egg Dome, the big Tokyo Egg Dome, Flair Fujinami occurred. Meltzer convinced me to go. Anyway, we got two for, two for one deal on tickets, but I was there two and a half weeks before Dave showed up. So Wally and I are on the All Japan and the FMW tour bus with all of those guys. So and you got uh, to hang around with Baba too. Wally came and we, when he brought Kiono the uh, following year, I guess it was when Flair started with WWF. Uh, he and then my editor, because I worked for both weeklies at the same time. No Gaijin had ever done that. Gaijin Foreigner. Uh, Fumi Saito's Weekly Pro, and 
we, uh, Wally and his whole family and his daughter stayed at our house. We, but before that, we'd all gone with Meltzer and Wade Keller to see the very first Hogan Flair match before Flair was even on WWF TV. This was at the Oakland Coliseum. And that's when the promoter that Scott knows, Bill Graham, died in that helicopter. It was a rainy night, sort of like when Evan, you know, was coming out of Madison Square Garden and John Lennon passed away. You, you knew the crowd's atmosphere, the people on the street were weird. There was something going on. And that Bill Graham was such a legend because, you know, the Bay Area was his home. He, he promoted rock music with the Stones and everything else all over the world. So, but no, Wally and I had been tight forever. And then he'd stay at my house when he was playing um, Yamaguchi son for WWF as a heel manager. You know, Mr. PP, Chop Chop PP. Yes. Uh, great, uh, great story. Hey, let me let me ask you guys. Um, I was having this conversation online today. What was the first wrestling sheet, not magazine sheet? Because um, Tom Burke says it, it goes back to the '60s. Well, our fan news, the fan clubs. We all ran fan clubs. Uh, Arisi and I took over the Blassey fan club when my LA immediate boss Scott, or excuse me, Jeff Walton was hired to do PR for LaBelle. And then I was, then I started the Tolis Brothers fan club. So I was doing Blassies with Arisi and then doing the Tolis Brothers. But, what was the, well, what was the well, first that's weekly what, or monthly sheet? Well, you know, he's, he's probably right. It was probably somebody's newsletter, like Rondo Bratz's. Scott, what was the name of that? Rondo Bratz had the, the closest thing to a newsletter I can recall from about 1969 on. Was it Wrestling Guide or something like that? And it was produced first class. Uh, Is that right? I just remember the uh, mimeographed um, with the blue ink and um, two or three pages. Now, at my sheet for the Tolis Brothers, I rarely wrote about them in my monthly newsletter, which was like 40 to 50 pages long each issue. And I copied what John Arizzi had done, starting with the Blassie fan club, had a free color picture, a real photo on the uh, uh, the cover of it. But I had world coverage. This was before the Observer started in like 82, 83. And I'm talking 72, 73. And Meltzer was one of my, I had like 60 correspondents, including, including Koichi Yoshizawa from Japan. He was one of six Japanese people. But I would, Mimeo, we had, I had access to early Xerox machine. Programs, ticket stubs from Japan, from Mexico, from England. So I was covering all the territories in North America and all the other stuff. And very little, you know, unless there was L.A. results on the Tolis Boys. So it was more something uh, like what Meltzer did later to, you know, put our artistic stuff out there. But it, a sheet sheet exposing the biz, is that, Evan, what you're talking about? I'm just talking a regular weekly or monthly sheet. Somebody said Matt Mania went back to 1965. It could. John Gallagher just died. Meltzer wrote a real nice tribute to Bill him. Bill Bratz died also. Yeah, Rondo Bratz died. That's one of the reasons I'm asking this, because after like 1,037 times on the Montreal screw job, you know, nobody's talked about the history of the sheets. Nobody. How come this isn't of interest? I have because there were, I can name about 100, probably Scott can too. Mick I, I can't. I never got involved with the sheets. Um, I was always, I was selling photos through Norman Keatser's magazine. Right. But I didn't pay attention to the sheets. But there's, there's a history to the sheets just like anything else. And I just don't think it's ever been fully documented. I think the wrong assumption is Meltzer started it all, which is far from the truth. The well, most, the the most successful. Were, yeah, they lead into the news. Letters. We would just have to see who was producing a newsletter that was uh, attempting to cover the biz truthfully, not just with results, but I'm talking about reporting that Blassie's a baby face, the top baby face in LA, while he's making trips back and forth for Vince Senior in 72 against Pedro is, is their top heel. And you know people start putting two and two together. Well, I'll tell you who was the most beloved person, and AJ will agree, it was Georgie. Yeah. I was just yeah. say that, Mark Lopez. Right. So the last and only conduit to everybody. She could communicate with Vince on down to, you know, unsmartened up marks and would tied everybody together. Talent. You know, she'd go right up to Shawn Michaels and talk to him. That was her baby, Evan. You know, remember she would call Sean, oh Sean, my baby. And uh, I, she I, had was, I was at I was at her wake and AJ will verify this. 
she had a picture of Bruno and a picture of Buddy Rogers in the casket with her. She was buried with these pictures. Right, AJ? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Talk about video. somebody <laughs> loving wrestling. Uh, yeah, uh, Napolitano and I took that. Uh, she was the only one that could get Rogers and Bruno. Uh, Bruno hated Rogers still, you know, feeling he was a, a real bully to a lot of the undercard jobbers and all of that in the early 60s before Vince begged them to come back in 63. Because sadly, as incredible as Buddy Rogers was, he just wasn't drawing as a heel champion. Because that's why Vince Senior, you know, for well, through all his career, he never went for a long period of time other than Billy Graham for six months with a heel champ because he just didn't draw with Graham Rogers. Was ten months. We just did Benny Scala's show, Nikita and I. We 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 did an hour on that last night. And there's a guy that should have, he was begging Vince Sr. to turn him face. He could have sold so much merch. He was one of the first, to, you know, there were others, Dick Byer, obviously. But yeah, they same, missed the opportunity with him. Yeah, they missed out with that. But so that photo, Georgie got uh, Bruno to agree to pose with uh, Rogers. This was a Rizzi's 91 convention, the uh, Weekend of Champions, when they I were both there. there. I was there. But Your you remembrance were, of all this is, is, is so incredible, Mike. It's so incredible that you still have the mind to remember all these experiences and all these people. It, it, only in wrestling is there heat that would last like 35, 40 years. Yeah. It took me years to convince Roy Shire, I've told this to Evan a million times, to, to he would at times come and, and co-host my TV show. He'd come from his Sebastopol horse ranch, co-host my TV show near Oakland. I begged him to come down. I'd drive him down to Cauliflower Alley. So it was 92, and uh, it was both Rogers only and uh, Roy Shires only CAC. But in the car, he's telling me how much he hated, what a motherfucker Buddy Rogers is. He stole my girl. Well, they were talking about uh, Cora Combs, and I guess Buddy, or excuse me, Roy Shire was dating her or sweet on her or whatever, and then she left him for Rogers. So long story short, we get there. Cauliflower Alley was only a one-day thing then, Scott. It was just the Saturday evening thing with the awards and dinner, and that was it. So at the, uh, the right before the awards started, you know, people are standing and talking to each other. Shire sees and spots Bobby Davis and Buddy together, which is pretty historic. Their backs are turned. He goes up, elbows Rogers, who spills his drink all over himself and Bobby Davis, and then and Shire tells me a little bit later, "Well, now I can die happy." And, you know, yeah. <laughs> like 1952 and we're talking 1992. So 40 years of heat. Scott, have you, could you ever rock music, even the sleaziest shit there? I have never heard of something like that. It can only be pro wrestling. Well, that's what keeps life interesting. And what people seem to not realize is that you're the original CAC photographer and have been with them for uh, what, since the 70s. And um, your work is always appreciated. And um, I, um, you know, we, we as photographers don't get the respect that we used to get. Why don't we have a, uh, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, it's supposed to be in September. It's, there's a watch and wait attitude, which is good. I know nobody wants it rescheduled again and blah, blah, blah. But we just want it safe. So if it's safe. Sure, but you know how many people aren't. We're not going to get the herd immunity. Don't get me started on this stuff. But there should be an award for photographers. You know, we don't always give out a Jill Melby Historian Award. A lot of us as photographers, you know, we're both historians. Uh, there's a million historians. And there are a lot of guys, Dave Brzezinski, Terry Sullivan, are doing that uh, big-time memories look at uh, uh, Michigan weekly free documentaries. Those guys are historians. There are a lot of them. And these people, all of these guys should be honored. I don't think we ever honored the late J. Michael Kenyon or even Tom Burke, who I think is at the pinnacle. He and Jim Melby were the pinnacle of historians. Next would be George Shire, uh, Scott Teal. Um, but there's a lot of uh, historian slash photographers that haven't been uh, honored. And I don't know, maybe at the Iowa Museum. I don't know if they're giving out a are they, they're giving out. They also have a Jim Melby Award, too. And let's not forget that. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sorry. Well, we're talking about, yeah, the, the photographers and historians. I mean, Georgie, who has to be the ultimate. She ran fan clubs in the 50s for Bruno Rogers and Chet Wallach, who was Johnny Valentine's tag partner. And 
I guess his second best friend next to Rogers. And she was so involved with all that stuff. And Fred Hornby, another guy, best friends with George. I knew Fred. He's gone also. Oh, the guy, you could give, say, okay, when did so-and-so wrestle so-and-so in the 40s? And he could just spit it right out without looking at anything. I did the oh. first Frank Gotch and George Hackenschmidt fan club back at the turn of the previous century. I started young. <laughs> it's all by telegraph. That's now, true. when somebody dies, the press goes to you, and you provide that picture. That's right. That's right. I, I, I was the baby third row ringside at Gotch Hackenschmidt. But how long was the match? Like seven hours? In the it was seven hours. I took a nap for about three of them in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Scott and, and, and AJ, I wanted to, to find out from both of you guys what your thoughts are on how you worked crowds as a manager and what sort of things you look for to, ma to make a crowd react to you when you were managing. Well, it's all timing, of course, and you have to know the spot. Um, when I could remember when I did it, and I would get a handful of, of booze, and then you learn, and you just learn the timing of when to do something as a heel to get the entire audience going nuts. I've been able to have the ability to do that. And I, a lot of my matches that I manage are on tape or on you are on um um, YouTube. So, uh, WWA Scott Romer and the, um, or Saul Creechman, Scott Romer, whatever, you'll see, uh, you'll see just exactly how I work the crowd. But I can't really explain it, um, until it's going on in the ring. I apologize. What about you, AJ? I, no, I have to concur 100%. Yeah, you have to feel out the crowd, you know, from, from a Saturday night to a you know, Friday night show. It'll be two different crowds, and there'll be different reactions each time. So you have to feel it out. Um, also, it's who you're working with. So not only the person you're managing, but also communicating with your opponent and playing with their strengths, working with them, making sure they get over, getting everybody to work and gel as a unit in the match. And... I, I, that helps a lot too, and like I've been lucky. A lot of people I've worked with, even if I not you know friends with or friendly with them, we I've at least crossed paths, so I know kind of what to look for in the opponents, what to play off of, and listen to their suggestions, suggest something. They're like, oh, let's why don't we try this in this match? I think it'll work. You know, it, it'll get me a lot of heat, or you know, you popping me, you know, here with at this point, it'll work out here. So and then we can set up for you know a rematch. So. I think a lot of that, but besides just feeling, yeah, you have to feel at that time. But work, working with your uh, the guy you're working with and their opponent. Do you think old school managers will ever make a comeback in today's modern wrestling world with kayfabe and everything? Well, managers have been a part of the business since the beginning of time. So I'm a little confused on that question because oh, I'm independent. Vince is publicly. Most people know behind the scenes he doesn't care for managers. That's why, really, there's only Heyman that we can think of, uh, and it's because he's just a genius on all levels. But Vince has tried to kill. That's what Buddy's alluding to. That Vince has kind of almost tried to kill managers. Whereas, you know, we see him in AEW, we see him in NXT. The former tag partner Jesse Goddard's in uh, Impact. What, what's his name? I can't think of it now. In TNA, uh, uh, Rob, uh, Rob, uh, Robert Stone. Yeah, yeah. Who's doing? He. The facials that guy does, they're out of this world. So you must be, AJ, you're like a sponge for uh, for old school managers, like as Russ is asking, because he kind of reminds me of a lot of that stuff, or, you know, elements of Cornet and elements of... Uh, uh, Cornet never was... Uh, he didn't come across to me as like a scaredy cat guy. You know, we see that... Uh, I mean, look at, look at what Heyman is doing now. Is it like weird the way he looks... At Roman Reigns, it's almost sick, like he's obsessed with him. And that's a real art to get that kind of thing across. I don't know if Scott's watching SmackDown, but you have to see Heyman. For those of us who remember him as a little kid in the back, asked him to have his picture taken with Albano, Davis, and Blassie, to see him now just, like, looking at Roman Reigns like he's obsessed with this guy. It, uh, you know, even though he's happily married with kids in real life, it's weird. Uh, Heyman you know, makes everything gold, and he even... I, I, he's one of the ones I've studied, and like even like when he was working with Brock, and he's just standing ringside. Brock's doing everything, and even like it was like a nine title match. Just I would 
caught my eye because I love I, I love him and I'm studying his work. And he would at certain points, like if let's say he was working Cena and Cena got him in trouble, and he Heyman's just clutching the belt for life, like scared out of his mind, and like oh like oh shit, like he has a chance to fucking take this from us. And little things like that, not not people when I branch it to my friends, like oh I didn't notice that. I would notice that. Like so I would like try to use that once in a blue moon. And look, he's, he's, look, he's his, look on YouTube. Uh, Paul in NWA, like around 1989, uh, managing the original Midnight Express against Cornette, who turned babyface with uh, Stan Lane and Eaton as that Midnight Express. And the promos, state of the art, Cornette and Heyman, who disliked each other legit, they out of this world, both of them, Cornette and Heyman. And uh, look at the stuff uh, Albano was doing. Actually, I think Albano, F, would you agree, Albano? was even better, as, as good as Blassie was, he was more a wrestler. Wiz was great, but he could get repetitive at times, you know, as much as we love Ernie Roth. But Albano was on a different plane of insanity. Oh, yeah. well. Alba Albano got the most heat. I mean, whether it was Bruno or Strongbow or Putski, whoever clocked him at the garden, he, he would, like, be on the mat like a fish out of water flapping around and the place went out of their minds, and this was before the match started. Before the match started. Yeah. Albano was well, great. That's an, that's an art. And uh, we also do a lot of pantomime and uh, make it look like we're out of our element. You know what I mean? We did something, and now we're out of our element, and we're about ready to get our ass kicked and then, and then bail out. Speaking, and, speaking of out of our element, we're almost out of time, so... I want to make sure that the uh, our fans can get a hold of you guys, and uh, if you have any upcoming projects or things you'd like to promote, now's a good time to, to tell our fans about it. Let's plug Scott's book, When It Was, My Life on Both Sides of the Camera. There we go. I, I recommend it, folks. Check it out. Very colorful stories, colorful characters, colorful anecdotes. I recommend it. And it is it and on Amazon? Or can they it it is it? on Amazon. And uh, if you want one autographed, you can write me, Scott, at scottromerphoto.com or inbox me on Facebook. And I'll see to it that you get a box. $20 plus $5 shipping if you do it with me. Um, free shipping if you do it through Amazon Prime, but it might take a little while. And... Um, uh, Get it from me. I make more money that way. It's packed, it's packed with photos. Ali. I mean, everybody's on there. George Bush, Mrs. Bush, Dusty Rhodes. There's a zillion photos uh, in there as well, too. I also have mentioned uh, I exposed what is considered one of the uh, worst angles in the history of pro wrestling, and that's the Onita stabbing angle where I was sent to Puerto Rico and... Uh, had a chance to work with uh, Onita and um, um, Colon, Carlos Colon, C Carlos and Jose. So uh, get the book uh, if you if you Google infamous Onita stabbing angle. My name's attached to it. It was something that we were afraid to talk about for many many years, but it was um, 30 years ago. So we've exposed it and. Uh, you know, Tony Atlas tells his story. I tell my story. It's uh, it's all good. And AJ, AJ, plug Titan and anything else you want to plug. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at AJPan underscore PCA. Uh, Instagram, AJPanPC. Uh, this coming Saturday, May 15th, uh, Titan Championship Wrestling, Wanted Dead or Alive, Jackson, New Jersey. Uh, I my my guy, the shining star, Ray Kalichi, will be in a four way match for the Titan Championship Wrestling Middleweight Championship. And then May twenty third in Boots, New Jersey, Upper Limit Wrestling. I'll be doing color commentary with Diane Ortiz. It's gonna be great out of action. Great to be back and have wrestling with live crowds again. Love it. There you wow. Go. Well it's great. You guys have been great guests. We'd love to have you back on again soon when you yeah. have uh, some more Eight stuff to promote. Thanks yeah. for having me. I'm quite honored to be a part of this group. Oh, thank you, Scott. Yes, likewise. Thank you, guys. And, thank you. Uh, your contributions were great, and we'll love to have you on again soon. So um, until then, everybody, thanks for being here this week, and we'll see everyone next week. Good night, everyone. Namaste. Namaste.